Looking forward to some baptisms later tonight. Uh, one baptism, but it's going to be super awesome, and we're going to celebrate together. Um, I'm not sure if you had a, a moment in your life where you're growing up and you really had this challenge that you had to face through. And at one point, it just became super overwhelming for you guys. Um, for me, it was uh, the biggest mountain for me to climb was actually learning the English language. And some of you guys know this about me. Uh, I was born and raised in Montreal, and so French was my first language. And then when I moved to grade three and grade four, I started speaking English. And I was forced to speak English, actually, because my parents were thinking about making a move towards Ontario or, or so on and so forth. So that was obviously a necessity. And um, I didn't like it because I was comfortable where I was at, um, speaking French in my elementary school and stuff like that. And honestly, I hated each lesson. Learning English was the stupidest thing ever. Like, I hated it. And because of, of this, uh, you can put it up there, every sea in the Pacific Ocean is pronounced differently. That is literally, like, the mind concept I had when I was learning the English language. It is such a stupid language to learn. There is no egg in eggplant. Did you know that? There's no ham in hamburger. Did you know that? Did you know that? There's neither pine nor apple in pineapple. I don't get. I understand what people say. Oh, it's hot as hell one day, and then it's cold as hell the other day. And I just don't. I think English is the stupidest language ever. That's. I'll be bare honest with you guys. This is truth for me. This is my therapy session, actually. So, and then I found out that English. You know, it just. It like this meme says. English just just has no rules. You can just put it up there. Like every word is just spelt horribly. And so even if you look at my manuscript here. You can look at my manuscript and you'd be like, wow, this is like literally HTML code pretty much here. <clears throat> Can't read it. But it was a gigantic climb, uh, mountain for me to climb. And it was really overwhelming at first. But I did it step by step. Um, step by step, I learned. And I learned from the mistakes. And as I gradually got older, gradually learned more, practiced more. Hey, here I am. I could kind of speak English. And what we learned last, and it's kind of the same thing with our lives and our journeys with God as well. When we learned last week, when we started this collection of talks called You in Five Years, last week we kind of took a look at, you know, whoever you want to be in five years. Kind of picture yourself in, in who you are, in who you want to be in five years, in 2028. And, and, and we talked about how time, it, it doesn't just blindly happen. Time doesn't change who you are. Time actually just reveals more of who you are, unless you make a drastic change, unless you make a drastic action. And so don't be overwhelmed by what you can't do, but only do what you can do, taking one step at a time in the right direction. And so with that in mind, if we, understanding that the little things towards the right direction will eventually take me to where God wants me to be, and that I can trust the process, and understand I'm not in a hurry to get quick results, if that's the case, well then, let's take a look at a couple Bible stories tonight. Last week, I read a psalm um, that was written by Moses. And a psalm is a song that is a, a song that exudes a typical, a, tip, a, a particular emotion um, that is happening through a triggered moment in history. That's a psalm. That's a song. The, uh, there's a book full of them. It is written primarily by a guy named David. But this one psalm that was written by Moses. And tonight, I want to take a look at that moment in history where Moses was prompted to write that psalm. And so let's take a look at that tonight. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, He'll be right behind me. It says, if you think these um, nations are more numerous than I, how can I dispossess them? You must not fear them. You must carefully recall what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh in all of Egypt, the great judgments you saw, the signs and wonders, the strength and power by which he brought you out. Know that you didn't do it on your own, friends. God did it. Thus the Lord your God will do all the people, uh, will do to all the people you fear. So just a quick little recap before we continue here. We took a, a, a look at this briefly last week, but we know that the Israelites have been in slavery and are now free. They're coming out of Egypt, out of captivity, but they're on their way towards the promised land, something that God has given them in hand. You're supposed to come out, but also enter in. But it didn't work like that for the Israelites. Because of the disobedience, because of their pettiness, um, they were not allowed to go into the promised land. So in between the coming out and entering in, we have this moment in time called the wilderness, which is this, um, this waiting, this limbo, this wasted time and potential. Because it says later on in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians, it says, Paul writes, may you be opened up to whatever Christ has for you. That is the concept of the Christian life. Because a lot of us think that when we accept Jesus, it's like we tick off this little box. 
and we're done, and it's over. We're like, okay, cool. I'll see you later in heaven. But if that were the case, God could have just killed you right after salvation, and you could just have your own personal rapture. So, so there's this lot of wasted time here on earth, and, and so what is the deal with that? Because God didn't just save you from hell. He wants to, he wants to also use you to shake the very gates of hell. He wants to use you in, in, in his plan and use you as an instrument to bring down heaven on earth. There's a plan on your life. It's not like, oh, I just came out of Egypt. For us in 2023, oh, God just saved me and I, I just came out of my past life or my past sin. God didn't save you from something. He saved you to and for something. There's a call in your life, my friends. If you don't understand what that means, God has a purpose, has a plan for you, and he loves every single one of you. And I know that sounds cliche, but he literally loves you. But he doesn't want you only to come out. He also wants you to enter in. And so if we're going to take him at his word and work out what he's already worked in, when you accepted Jesus, he crammed all of eternity, all of the goodness, all of the grace, all of your uh, calling inside of your heart potentially to come out until you actually practice it and apply it into your lifestyle once you've accepted Jesus. So the question is, how do you do that? Answer is one step at a time. Let's finish off the rest of the story. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 21. You must not tremble at their presence, for the Lord your God, who is present among you, is a great and awesome God. He, the God who leads you, will expel the nations, listen, little by little. You will not be allowed to destroy them all at once, lest the wild animals overrun you. The Lord your God will give them over to you. He will throw them into a great panic until they're destroyed. So we have God, who's this big cosmic force. He can just flex his biceps and the entire earth will shake. But yet he's working with little tweezers here saying like, oh, I'm going to give you this whole land. I'm going to give it to you. But little by little. I don't like that. Because for me, when I want God to do something, I'm like, God, give me the whole pie. Give me the whole cake. But we understand through this story, and as a common denominator as well, when you read very carefully over the course of Scripture, as a common denominator, we learn that God is a God of process. If we're going to trust him and actually take him at his word, then we have to take a hold of the same strategy that God has planned for you, little by little. God is a God of process. We see um, King David, before he was king, one of the most popular characters in the Old Testament, when he gets anointed to be king at 15 years old, he doesn't go into his throne until he's 30. God's got a process. He's not in a hurry. He's not in a rush. Even in the New Testament, that's where the disciples who are following Jesus, they're like, come on, Jesus, what are we doing next? What's the next miracle? Jesus is like, whoa, 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 hold up. Come. Breathe. Just walk with me. Like, sleep in the same homes as me. Eat with me. Even in the story right here in the Old Testament that we just read, it took seven years just for them to complete the major battles, not including the, the little ones here and there afterwards. We are needed to understand the danger of doing too much too soon, to be careful um, with biting off more than you can chew and allowing your mouth to write checks that your body can't cash, as they say in the streets. So what's the solution? We well, just lay one brick at a time. Just lay one brick at a time. There's no special mind-blowing formula here. It's just one brick at a time. There's this beautiful story in the book called Nehemiah. And it's this man from Jerusalem that has gone, has left Jerusalem to go work for the king as a cup bearer. That's his, that's his job. Just brings the pimp juice towards the king and that is just job 24-7. And now he's these left. <laughs> Sorry, I just came out of it. I don't know why I speak all the time. Um, now when he's left, <laughs> the Jerusalem walls that have protected the city of Jerusalem, in uh, this little bit of historical timeline here, has, has now been broken down because of, of Babylon, and has come and invaded and destroyed the walls, and the walls is now in complete ruins and in complete rubble. Jerusalem is pretty much in disarray at this point in history where we get introduced to the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah goes in communication with his friends back and forth, asking, hey, how is it going? How are the walls? Is it still in ruins? 
until he comes to a point where he just breaks. And uh, his friend's like, dude, the walls are still broken. And we come towards Nehemiah 1.4, and it says, at this point, like, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. So he convinces, at this point, after we read this verse, he convinces the king to go back, to go back home to Jerusalem, and he rallies this community and to go build back the wall. But here's the interesting stat. These walls haven't been destroyed and been in ruins for just a year. Not even five years. Not even a decade. These walls have been in ruins for over 120 years. And when Nehemiah got his community together, they started rebuilding the wall brick by brick. Guess how long it took them? 52 days. 52 days. The walls have been in ruins for 120 years, but once they hunkered down and got to work, it took 52 days. And so it got me thinking. Because for decades, and even over a century, the city, the walls have been in ruins, and the people of Jerusalem have just literally been like tiptoeing over the rubble for over 120 years. Like they're going to work this way, they're going to the grocery store this way, they're walking their kids to school this way, not even thinking about picking up anything. And it got me thinking, why wouldn't anyone do something about this? Because 120 years. Unlike Nehemiah, listen to this, if you don't see the value in it, you won't pick it up. Right? If you don't see the value in it, you won't pick it up. So the, pick it up. And the question I want to ask you is, what is the it in your life? Because a lot of us, when we embark on our five-year journey, a lot of our lives are just kind of like this, to be honest. It's kind of in ruins. It's messy. But yet we're still tiptoeing over the things in our lives, not dealing with it as we properly should. So the question is, what is the it in your life? For some of us, it's addiction. And we tiptoe around it, the addiction of, of pornography or, or substances or even gossip and lying. And, and we know we should be better, but we don't have time to deal with it. Or maybe it's relationships. Gosh, some of you guys, your dating life is just a revolving door of people. Ouch. And we step over it and, and we step over it because you don't want to talk about it. Some of you, it's your purpose in life. My friends, God has given you an incredible dream and purpose and destiny. But you're here just kind of tiptoeing around of it, acting all too stuck up for it, thinking to yourself, I don't have time for it. But if we can see the value of the things in our lives, how we picture ourselves in five years, if we could just picture the value in our lives and get down and get to work, and we start taking brick by brick, and we start building it out, And think to yourselves, I can be a good, strong man of God. I can be a woman with godly confidence. I can beat my addiction. I can have a stable relationship. I can have a great, I can have a great marriage. If we can think like that and just get to work putting it brick by brick, it won't look much now. But if we just keep going one brick at a time, one step at a time, you'll realize that with consistency and with compound interest that we talked about last week, you realize that you can build a life that God has given you power to build up. One brick at a time. One step at a time. You can do this. And so how do we do that? So I want to give you just a few practical things to bring home, and hopefully you can apply it tonight and even tomorrow. How do we do this one, step by step? So the first one is, you got to choose it. Choose the thing. What, choose the first brick you're going to lay down. And choose it small. That's your goal-setting standard. Choose it small, and get this, I'll take it one step further, choose it stupidly small. It says in the famous book, Atomic Habits, by James Clear, he says, people often think it's weird to get hyped about one, reading one page or meditating for one minute or we're making one sales call. But the point is to master the habit of showing up. A habit must be established before it can be improved. I like how he said that. Building the habit of just showing up. So last week, I gave you guys a chance to write down on a piece of paper some things that you maybe want to achieve in the next five years. 
It could be um, something to do with your money, with your career, with your relationships, or even, even with your journey with God. So what is the first brick that you ought to choose? Choose it and choose it small. James Clear says it should be so small that it's almost embarrassing to talk about. I was chatting with one of our young adults last week, Josh, over coffee, and we we're laughing because we're talking about this. This is so true. Like, you can't just like, wake up one morning, not be a runner, and then just crush out a marathon. If you've never done a push-up in your life, you can't just crush out 100 push-ups in your life in, in, in one day. But you know what you can do? Crush one push-up. Now, I see your faces. You're like, oh, rips, that's so, that's so easy. But that's the point. It's supposed to be small and stupidly small because it's actually even worse for you not even doing it because it's so stupidly easy. Just one push-up. And since you're doing that push-up because that's your goal for the day, while, while you're down there, might as well just get some extra credit and just bang out three, four, five more. And you'll just feel extra good about yourself for the day. Don't read a book a day. Just read one page a day. Really easy. Because all that is doing is mastering the habit of showing up. Just read one page. And hey, you know what? If you're feeling frisky and naughty, read a second page. How about that? <laughs> These are scholars who study um, the psychology of habits and came towards these things called the keystone habit. Where one, um, I was talking to a young adult just before the service about it. And it's one habit where, it's, uh, where it, if it's accomplished, it actually cascades and kind of creates this domino effect for positive reinforcement and kind of gets you to do more things. So for example, um, it's proven psychologically that making your bed in the morning is a keystone habit because once you did it, you feel like that dopamine hit and you feel good about yourself that you accomplished something and now you're ready to do more. Another thing is, oh, on a side note, you know, about making your bed in the morning, when the disciples went to go visit the empty tomb, Jesus' clothes were already folded and his bed was made. Coincidence? <laughs> I'm just saying, this is biblical stuff, people. Exercise is also a keystone habit because it'll cascade into, 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 into better things. Like when you work out, you're most likely going to go out and grab a healthy lunch or a smoothie because you put so much time and effort invested into it, and so you're probably not going to be like pretty stoked on getting a Whopper. Believe it or not, in the Christian world, tithing is a keystone habit. Like you're financially partnering with your church, and when you give financially, you feel the weight of that faith. And you want to follow up with it and continue investing into it because where your heart is, um, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will follow, right? So when you choose the right habits, it can spiral in a positive way to do greater things. The second thing is clarify it. I know it sounds a bit rudimentary, but like, hear me out. In law firm vocabulary, once you have those small specific habits, you got your first couple of bricks, you'll need to um, figure out bright lines versus fuzzy lines. It's kind of terms they use in law firms when they build up a contract. You want to have bright lines compared to fuzzy lines. And that's pretty self-explanatory, but it's meant to be accountability for yourself. And so I would suggest if you're building stronger habits, don't add er to the end of things. Meaning like, I want to be healthier, or I want to be better. Because the question is like, how, how, how do you define success there? What's the metric of you getting better actually through that? So instead of saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be healthier, say, I'm not going to eat Doritos this whole month. Or if you're like me, i will be like, I'm not going to eat chips and guac every night. And it may not be, I'm going to watch less porn. It's, maybe it's going to be, no, I'm not going to be on the internet if I'm alone in the room. See, you got to make bright lines versus fuzzy lines. The third thing is track it. Track it. Why do I say that? Well, my friends, if you're not keeping score, well, you're just practicing. It almost means nothing, to be honest with you. And it's really hard to motivate yourself at a level of a competitor. Because as as Christ followers, we are living the level of competitors, essentially. It says it right there in the book of Hebrews. Paul says, I run, not just like messing around. I'm not just like frolicking through the forest just for kicks and giggles. It means something. I'm running to get the prize. I want to get to heaven. Paul is saying, I want to get to heaven, and I want my God to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. And how awesome is that, that we would go towards the end of our lives and go to heaven, go to eternity, and look at the God of the universe, and he speaks over us. Hey, Reuben, that thing I planted in your heart as a potential, you did it. You accomplished it. And you did it with greatness. You did it with faith. You did it with obedience and integrity. And so that's what Paul is saying here. Is like, I'm running this race. I'm not screwing around here. 
I want to go and do something with this because if you're not going to keep score, you're just practicing and you're just messing around and playing around. You know who plays around? Children. But for me, in my journey of who I want to look like in five years, this means something. This holds weight. This is my life we're talking about. And so when I run towards Jesus, I'm doing with purpose. I'm doing with aim. I'm doing with integrity and character. Even if it takes me a couple breaks at a time, I'm going for it. So I'm going to run, and it means something to me. In the book, The Four Disciplines of Execution, the author says, um, bowling through a curtain might be fun in the beginning, but if you can't see the pins fall, it will soon become boring, even if you really love bowling. Like, I love how just so simple that is, but it makes so much sense. Something changes when you can keep a track of it and keep the score. Four, protect it. Protect your first brick. And as that goes, we're going to try and stack up as many wins as possible. Because what? Little by little, give it time to compound interest like we talked about last week. In the book, Superhuman by Habit, the author writes, this one's not on the screen, I don't think, but just listen up. It says, by failing to execute, potentially, you're not just losing a minor bit of progress, but rather threatening the cumulative benefits you've accrued by establishing a habit. This is a huge deal and should not be treated lightly. So make your habits relatively easy, but never miss doing them. In doing the research of the science of habit formation, there's this phrase that psychologists has coined, never miss twice. Never miss twice. Because as human beings, we're going to miss. We're prone to self-sabotage. We're going to fall, we're going to stumble, we're going to regret saying that one thing, but the concept is don't miss twice. Meaning, you're going to put so much emphasis on that habit that you are investing into that you're going to guard it and protect it with everything you have. There's also another term called habit suicide, where, one, where when um, you've missed more than three times, it gets, just, gets really hard to get back on track, and it's also demotivating in the long run. But listen to me, young adults. I'm sharing this and yeah, we're talking about habits and we're talking about like productivity and efficiency. And it could be really cool to talk ab about this in the TED Talk, but this is not a TED Talk. This is like biblical stuff. This is something that God has laid out in his, in his word, in the Bible. And so in this life, my friends, it's going to be two step forwards, one step backwards. But whenever you make those habits, and I know some of you guys, myself included, we're going to put a brick here, but then sometimes this is going to fall off. Break here, something that's going to fall off. And when we do that kind of stuff, it's easy for us to lose hope. But I want to give you encouragement and say from the stage tonight, do not lose hope. Do not lose faith. Because we're going to make some mistakes. And, and my heart breaks because there's some people out there purchasing self-help books, but not pursuing the true helper. And when they're doing that, they're just grasping at straws. There's no true hope for them. There's no anchor for them. There's no compass that will guide them. But we do. We have that. We have the gospel. We have the cross. We have a savior that loves you so much that he's willing to give up his life so you can have one. So if you fall, it's okay. If you make a mistake, it's okay. Because we have hope to grasp onto. So grasp onto it, my friends. Our God's God who loves his children coming towards him. There is no short of, shortage of supply because he keeps loving his children, demanding it. So why accept Jesus into your life? Because whatever is unsustainable in your life, he makes it sustainable. He delivers a lifeline into your life where nothing else can survive. So we chose it, we clarified it, we tracked it, we protected it, and last, we celebrate it. We celebrate it, guys. We may not feel like it. It might feel insignificant to celebrate, complete that one push-up. We're going to be like, whoo, go me. We see that all throughout the scripture. The, the people in the Bible, come on, let's keep going forward. Let's move on, Jesus. No. No, tonight we're, tonight we're having a feast. Tonight we're having supper with friends. Tonight we're going to throw a party. Every step you take forward, God wants you to take moments to savor the accomplishment, no matter how big or how small it may look. To savor the momentum and then capitalize on the momentum. We're going to do our thing. We're going to create our goal. And by the end of the day, every single day, we're going to be like, okay, we're going to worship the God of the empty tomb. 
going to worship the God of the cross. I'm going to worship the God that was faithful in my previous battle and that's going to give me encouragement for my next battle. I'm not asking you to change the world. I'm asking you to change your own world. To say yes every single morning. To show up another day. Because sometimes it may look like it's two steps forward and one step backwards, but I'm going to show up. Next morning comes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be faithful. That one push up a day. That one page a day. For you, <laughs> it may look something different. Maybe it's not push ups. Hopefully something different. I'm going to show up. I'm going to, I'm going to keep being there. The Guinness, <clears throat> the Guinness Book of World Records says that the, mo- See here. No, I got it. that the most time a single sheet of paper can be folded over and over again is 12. Now that's impressive because I have a piece of paper right here and I can't get past six. So I got, you know, you got one fold, you got two, you got three, four, five, six. Okay? That seventh, I don't know what kind of witchcraft people have to do to get that seventh fold and so on and so forth, but holy crap. And you're thinking, there, like, oh my gosh, Rubes, you're so weak. Skip leg day, didn't you? Easy there, shut up. P90, whatever. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it's crazy. Um, but the, the Guinness World Book of Records has certified 12. And given the fact that the, the woman who did it had a 4,000-foot uh, sheet of paper made out of tissue. But still nuts, right? Still nuts. Now, when I fold it, it doubles, obviously. But with compound interest, it actually exponentially gets thicker. So you know, you, you've seen a piece of paper. You, you've seen how thick it is. It's, it's hairline thin. But I only, f- you, right in front of you, it's, I only folded it six times. And you can see how much compound interest has made it look so much thicker, right? I did six right in front of your eyes. But if I was physically able to get the 26 folds, it would be taller than Mount Everest. If I get to 42 folds, it would be to the moon. 51, I pass the sun. 103, that number of folds would be 93 billion light years, which is the size of our known universe. That's the power of compound interest. And it's mind blowing. But even for God, that amount of folds, God's still like, yep, fits right in my, in my little fingers right here. He's huge. He knows it. He knows it all from beginning to end. We may not see the results right now. We're putting these bricks brick by brick and we're not seeing this gigantic wall and we get discouraged. But a reminder, God knows it all. He has orchestrated, orchestrated everything for, for you from beginning to end. He already sees the, the picture, the puzzle creates. He already sees the baked pie when we see the raw ingredients. The Bible says that he is alpha and omega, meaning that he is the beginning and he is the end. He's the author and he's the finisher. And guess what? He's got you in the palm of his hand. As we finish and, and, and land the plane tonight, I want to read this last quote. Hopefully it would encourage you. It's by this famous preacher who's passed away named Charles Spurgeon. He says, Courage, courage, my heart. Go on little by little, for many littles will make a great whole. And so tonight, I want to encourage you to get better encouraging yourself. Remind yourself that you're still human. Remind yourself to give yourself grace and to breathe a little bit. Towards the end of the series, we're going to continue next week with uh, Pastor Jeff, and I'll, I'll finish it off on October 1st. On October 1st, um, I want to invite you to be here. Make it, make it a prior to be here. Afterwards, we're going to have some good stuff. We have an activity after the service. I can't tell you yet. Surprise. Um, but also, the other thing that we want to do is, if you want to, it's not mandatory. We're not going to twist anyone's arm for this. But we're going to set up kind of like a little, some, some tables and some, some coffee, some hot chocolate in the lobby afterwards. And if you want to, um, you can grab a piece of paper and sit down and write a letter to yourself in five years. You're going to write a letter to future you. Write down, hey, what do you want to look like? Hey, Ruben, you know, I hope, you know, you've accomplished this and excited to see you in five years doing this and this and this and whatever it might be. And afterwards, you can fold it up and give us an address. We'll put an envelope and we'll mail it out to you in five years. 
Now put an address where we can probably reach you. <laughs> if it bounces back, it's not our fault. But, you know, maybe you want to put like a parents, a folks home, whatever it is, and stuff like that. Some, somewhere you'll be, you'll know we'll get to in five years, and we'll mail it to you. And we'll see how that goes. Some of you guys will be really encouraged. Some of you guys will not be encouraged. <laughs> oh, crap. I forgot that I was supposed to do that. Um, <laughs> so that'll be happening on October 1st. So be here. Be here for that. Bring a friend with you. It'll be really cool to do this together as a community. We'll serve some hot chocolate. We'll serve some coffee and stuff like that. It'll be really chill. And afterwards, we can get to our activity. The other thing, too, is that um, uh, not just for this series, but we're making it a, a priority and a practice for every collection of talks that we do this year. We want to provide like a book for sale. Um, if you want to buy it and kind of go deeper into whatever we're talking about. And so last week I talked about that and, and I said we have two books that are paired perfectly with this series, this collection of talks. And last week we sold out all the books already. So we bought more books. We're good. We're restocked. And so the books are 30 bucks each. Um, if you want to go take a look at them outside, you're more than welcome to. They're really, really good books that can kind of like give you some deeper understanding of what we're talking about this month. So if you want to look into that, go for it. I want to pray for you. And we'll transition into um, our baptism story. But um, from my heart to yours, just want to say that we're cheering you on. I know it may sound a little forward, but we love you. Don't be creeped out by that. We're praying for you. We're championing you. We're supporting you. Every Tuesday morning, our staff meets together. We, we pray for you. And just know that you don't have to do this by yourself. You can do it in community. And I don't want to make this like a shameless plug to come to connect, Connecting Point next week. But in all honesty, like come to Connecting Point next week. Sign up for a small group. Be part of community. We are also in like a dire need of, of leaders. And so please, if you are willing to step up to the plate, please do so. Come talk to myself or Chelsea after the service. And let's go for it, let's go for it together. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for our time together. And in Jesus' name, we pray for everyone here as they embark on their journey to be better in 2028. So Father, we pray that uh, we will learn something and that we wouldn't just hear it in out one year and out the other, but that we would apply it to our lives. And so Father, would you give everyone grace and wisdom to do the things you called us to do? We might make mistakes, but God be with us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now we have, we have uh, one baptism tonight but it is, uh, it is a special one. And um, I get the honor of introducing her because she's honestly like the face of the project. She's here every week. She's serving. She's a youth leader. And she has an incredible story to share. And, and uh, honestly, we've seen Brooke grow um, fantastically over the last uh, years. And so and we're so excited to um, see her get baptized. And we're really pumped and excited for her. And honestly, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna cry. This is super emotional for me because we love Brooke so much. And so uh, Abby, why don't you come and bring the mic over? And as she gets ready, you got your little kazoo singy. Um, let's give a huge round of applause to Brooke Kerr as she comes out, everybody. <laughs> So I didn't grow up in a Christian home. In fact, I grew up in a house full of fear and anxiety at the hands of my father. I was sexually abused and threatened for many years by my father until my mom found out one, one day and she moved herself, my sister, and I to another city in order to keep us safe. And I am forever grateful that she did that for us. After going through criminal and family court with my mom and my family, finally, she finally had full custody of us, one of the best days of my life. After countless weekends spent with my father by ordered by law lawyers in court, it was a relief to never have to see him again. I used to be so ashamed to talk about it, like it was somehow my fault, but with lots of prayer and therapy, I have come to understand that it wasn't my fault. I was just a kid after all. Fast forward a few years and we are moving cities again. This time, the city was in a different province. It's 2013 and we are moving from Toronto to Beaumont, Alberta, after me spending a few months in hospital, discovering that I have a mental illness. When I moved to Beaumont, um, when we moved to Beaumont is when I became a Christian at the age of 18. I was starting grade 12 over again because I had missed so much of my grade 12 year from being hospitalized and was starting the school year in a new province where I knew nobody my age. So my aunt who was staying with me, 
who I was staying with knew someone on her street whose daughter went to the youth group at a local church. I thought of going, the thought of going was a bit daunting, but I went anyway. Something was telling me I needed to go and check it out for all it was worth. This was terrifying because at the time I was still pretty super painfully shy. But this is where I heard about God's love for the first time and everyone there was so kind, some of the kindest people I've ever met. These people didn't look at me and judge me or talk behind my back or pretend to like me. They were genuine, some of which I'm still friends with 10 years later. I haven't had the easiest life and I used to ask God why my life was the way it has been before I even knew he existed. I would ask what I thought was the universe and as a child I would ask when the pain would end. I really hope that one day my story can inspire someone else to see God like I did. And I hope through my story you can see how God is who how good God is despite the evil in the world. After becoming a Christian, my life still hasn't been all rainbows and butterflies. I actually spent another three months in hospital for my bipolar disorder in 2017. And that was hard not just for me, but for everyone who had to witness me being not myself. I even had to spend some time in a locked psychiatric unit. Luckily, I don't remember a lot of that time in my life because of the treatment I had where they basically shocked my brain back into working order. Just because life isn't always super easy doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for us. My favorite verse is actually what I actually have tattooed on my arm is Psalm 46, 5. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. About a month ago, Abby actually preached on Psalm 46, and it was then when I decided to get baptized. God kept telling me that someone needs to hear my story and to hear God is with them always. So today, I'm being baptized in front of my friends and my family, not saying it will be smooth sailing from here on out, but when it is tough, I have someone looking out for me who knows exactly how each day will end and begin, and that is pretty cool. Brooke, one more time, guys. I'm gonna invite. I'm gonna invite everyone to stand with me right now. And does someone bring a shofar or something with you guys? That was somewhere here. It's like this cry for Braveheart. <laughs> yeah. I want to read this last verse uh, before we go into worship. It's a, it's a simple verse. It says in Psalms 145, 3, it says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. Great is the Lord. He's most worthy of praise. Another translation says, Great is the Lord, and greatly he is to be praised. Um, I need to get just a little bit churchy with you guys, but I just need to say this, that your worship and praise towards God is in direct correlation to how you see him. Does that make sense? So if you see him as a average God, then you give him average praise. If you see him as a mediocre God, then you give him mediocre praise. But if you see him as a great God, then we give him great praise. This is an old saying, older saying people taught me when I was a younger kid, and they said, uh, God has kept me. And over my life, I've realized what the meaning of, and the weight of that really entails. And you don't understand the value of that meaning, God kept me, until you've had a moment where you almost, left, you almost lost God. And for some of you in this room, I'm just going to say it, God has been good to you. God has been great to you. And we may not see it, we may not feel it, but God has come on your behalf so many times. You will not understand the gravity of God being a healer until you're sick. You won't understand the gravity of God being your counselor until, like, me a couple years ago, I had a panic attack in the middle of my message. You won't understand 
um, the gravity of God being your shield and your rock until you, uh, you've left, uh, lived vulnerably. And so, so uh, some of you guys have, have, have gone through life and you realize, oh, God's not here. God's not showing up. God's not speaking to me. On average, humans make, on average, 10 to 20,000 decisions a day. But you and I think about all the major ones. What time we wake up, what we're going to eat, what clothes we're going to wear. We can count probably on 10 fingers how many decisions we're going to make a day. But there's thousands upon thousands of decisions that you have made subconsciously that has brought you here today. And it's the exact same thing with God. We think to ourselves that God has to show up like, a, like, like fire and an earthquake and a, and a mighty gusty wind. We think that God moves only when we feel him tingling in our, in, our, in our emotions and we cry and that's when God is evident. But there's so many times that God has come through on your behalf that you have not, may not seen it. But God is good. God is faithful. And although life may look, be looking tough right now, God is for you. He is by your side. And if greatly is the Lord, then greatly he is to be praised. And so when we go into worship, I'm just going to leave that with you. That, that our worship and our praise is a, di- a direct response in how we see God. So let's pray and let's worship together. Father, we love you. We thank you. We, we praise you greatly. You are not just this average, mediocre, subpar God. You are a great God. You come through for us time and time again. And even though we may not see it, even though we may not feel it, you are there and you are present. And you are here with us holding our hand every step of the way. So in this moment, may we worship you. May we, may we stretch out our palms, may we stretch out our hands and worship you in Jesus' name. You are here in this room and we love you. And, and, and for those that are here that are just going through something, that are struggling through something, that maybe it's this negative weight and burden on their life, Father, I pray that you would just set them free, that you would break chains, that you would lift them from that burden in Jesus' name. So we worship you with everything we have. We love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.